Good morning. Welcome to Bond Shenick and King's fifth and final webinar in a series uh, celebrating Manufacturing Week. My name is Caroline Westover. I am a member here at Bond Shenick and King in our Syracuse office. And today our topic is intended to focus on navigating integration issues in the manufacturing industry. Certainly there has been um, a lot of activity in this first year um, for the Trump administration, and we've been quite busy since January. So the purpose this morning and what our session goals are intended to discuss are first and foremost employment verification issues uh, to provide some updates with respect to that. Then we'll talk about some common visa issues for work purposes in the manufacturing sector. And then finally, we'll talk about what may be on the horizon under the current administration that could have an impact on manufacturers throughout the United States. With that being said, um, just one administrative note, the slides for this presentation are available to everybody um, in the program that you're viewing. But certainly if you have any questions or concerns, don't hesitate to reach out to our marketing department. Okay, so our first discussion topic this morning, employment verification issues. We know that under the Immigration Reform and Control Act of 1986, employers are required to identify and verify the employment eligibility of all of their employers hired, excuse me, their employees hired after November 6, 1986. We commonly refer to this as the I-9 verification process. IRCA, the, the governing statute here, prohibits employers from knowingly hiring or employing workers who are not authorized to work in the United States. Now, some people might say, what does the term knowingly mean? Well, it includes actual, actual or constructive knowledge. And when we talk about constructive knowledge, that means information that we could infer um, through certain facts or circumstances that would lead us to conclude that an individual may not be authorized to work in the U.S. For example, if the facts don't add up, if an employee comes to you for I-9 verification purposes and then says, here's my three social security cards, pick which one you want. Clearly, that could be a fact or circumstance that might suggest to us that perhaps this individual is not authorized to work in the U.S. because they have multiple copies or different documents when, in fact, they should only have one. So let's take a moment and identify who is and who is not subject to I-9 employment verification. Certainly we know that current employees um, should not be subjected to I-9 verification procedures, uh, except in four instances. The first is if we do not have an I-9 on record or on file for an employee, then obviously if we discover this during an internal audit or during some other process, we need to make sure that we have an I-9 for each employee. The key here being that the employee has to be hired or was hired on or after November 6, 1986. We frequently get calls from clients who are very concerned that they do not have an I-9 for everyone. And then when we tell them, take a pause, what was their date of hire? If it was 1982, we don't need to worry about it. No need. But if you have current employees, for example, that were hired in 2015 and you don't have an I-9 form, clearly that's a problem and an issue and it needs to be corrected immediately. The second circumstance is during an audit, um, we discover that we've got deficiencies in those records that require verification procedures. Again, we see this frequently when clients are in good faith checking their records for compliance and they discover, uh-oh, we only have an I-9, we have an I-9 for this individual, but the I-9 is incomplete at best. So in that case, it's appropriate in order to try and correct your records to go back and, and conduct appropriate re-verification as necessary. The third circumstance for current employees is when the employer has been involved in a merger or an acquisition and wants to make sure that those employees acquired during the merger have the appropriate I-9 records. Sometimes when we're talking about mergers and acquisitions, the acquiring employer may sign as part of the corporate transaction to accept uh, the prior employer's I-9 records as is. 
The good news with that is it can be an administrative ease for the acquiring employer. The bad news is they take the good with the bad, meaning any problems and errors um, conducted or contemplated by the earlier employer now become the new employer's problem. As an alternative, an acquiring employer can also decide in the appropriate circumstance to basically conduct brand new I-9s for any new employees coming into the organization as part of that merger and acquisition. So the good news here is employers have two options. It really will depend on individual circumstances as to how those companies will follow through. Fourth, if you have some current employees that have indicated on their Form I-9 that they have time-limited work authorizations where re-verification is required. That is a common practice where an employee may have temporary work authorization that will expire in one year, in two years, in three years, for example. Then we need to make sure that even though they remain current employees, when that expiration date comes due, we are doing what we need to do to go back and re-verify that employee so that we know they're authorized to continue working. Certainly the other category that should come as a surprise to nobody is new hires. Any new person hired by the employer, even if it's for one day, must undergo the I-9 verification process. Um, and so we need to make sure typically when we have this discussion with our manufacturing clients is to say, who are you putting on your payroll? If you're putting somebody on your payroll, then we need to make sure that they are properly verified. Independent contractors. We wanted to note this because we see independent contractors and consultants frequently working with manufacturing clients. Think about it. The I-9 process is intended for an organization to verify the work authorization of its workforce, its employees. By their very nature, independent contractors are not your employees. They're independent of your organization. So, we do not need, nor should we be, going back and verifying the employment eligibility of these individuals. You can certainly take a process or take the position that you want a contractor to verify to you or to certify to you that they've conducted their own I-9 verification process so that workers coming onto your facility, if they're not yours, maybe they're your contractors, that they're authorized to work in the U.S., but we are not the ones to be checking those documents and going through that specific I-9 verification process. So again, the short version here is that we do not verify independent contractors or consultants. Internal transfers. Employees transferred within the same company, maybe to a different subsidiary, an affiliate, or a division, do not need to undergo a new I-9 verification procedure. It may be good practice, however, for that employee's I-9 form and I-9 records to follow along with him or her to the new entity. Uh, but certainly, just because they change physical locations does not mean that we need to be redoing verification for them. Rehires. This is always a tricky category. Why? Because a lot of the clients that call us, um, it's not uncommon in the manufacturing sector to hire a group of people, maybe for several months, you may have a voluntary layoff, then you may rehire people again uh, later on. So if, if an organization hires or rehires an employee within three years from the date that the I-9 verification was completed, the employer can complete the new I-9 form by completing section three of the form, technically the re-verification piece. If the employee has worked for the company uh, for a number of years and then leaves, um, the same rules don't necessarily apply. So with respect to rehires, if an employee is still authorized to work, then we want to make sure that we're putting that authorization date and the rehire date in Section 3. If the employee is no longer authorized to work, we've got to re-verify the individual's documents all over again. We do have, as I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, some changes to the Form I-9. And so we want to take a moment this morning to go through what some of those changes are. Um, interestingly, for years, we have used um, versions of the Form I-9 without any changes whatsoever. And yet, in less than one year, late 2016 and now 2017, 
we've had two completely new Form I-9s to use. Um, so we want to make sure that we just review what we should be using as employers and making sure that you've got the latest updates. So in November 2016, um, the Federal Administration published a new updated Form I-9. Uh, with this form, it went into effect or was slated to go into effect for use on January 22nd, 2017. There were a number of significant changes to this form and we'll review those in a moment. Then, after about seven months in existence or in effect, the federal government once again updated the Form I-9 and published the updated version, which now went into effect for September 18th, 2017. So as of today, it's, it's important that all employers are using the current updated form, which is the January, excuse me, the July 17th version, because the prior forms are no longer valid. And if an employer continues to use an expired form, it can be deemed a violation of I-9 rules subjecting an employer to civil fines and penalties. So first and foremost, you want to make sure that you've got the right version. The other point that I comment here, and I frequently hear from clients is, it's a simple form, how hard can it be? And you may think that at first, but what I can tell you from years of experience is that just because the form may be short in length um, doesn't mean that it's not complicated. Um, in fact, it's so complicated that the government has issued now, I believe about 15 pages worth of instructions um, to enable employers to fill out this very short form properly. Uh, I think the welcome, it's been a welcome addition to have more detailed instructions because failing to follow and properly complete this form can lead to significant penalties. So um, certainly that, that's a positive note. Let's revisit the, the 2016 changes because those really were the most significant and they've carried over onto the current form. So significantly, it has begun as a smart form. And what do I mean by smart form? For those of us that are not technologically savvy, sometimes myself included, uh, this smart form is really um, something that you shouldn't ignore. I think it can be very helpful for employers to minimize the number of errors that you see on there. Uh, rarely do I tout um, a government update as an improvement, but I do think it can be helpful here. Now the smart form benefits only come into play if you complete the form I-9 online with a computer. So those of you doing it the old fashioned way, pen and paper, um, may not be a bad idea to check your homework, if you will, to see, to make sure that your handwritten form I-9 um, is correct. But what this smart form does is it walks you through box by box the information that needs to be completed. In many aspects, it provides drop down menus, or if you miss a number, for example, in the social security number, um, you'll get a pop-up message that says incomplete. Um, there will be an error message. So it's helpful to make sure, one, that you've completed all the necessary information. Two, it can serve as a check and balance to let you know if you're missing some key information, maybe like a number or a digit. That happens quite frequently. Um, three, it can auto-populate certain information as well. For example, if you have a foreign national that has what's called an A number, an alien registration number. If you enter that on section one, then they will automatically pre-populate that number onto page two for an employer in the right circumstances. That can be helpful because we all know that sometimes it's very easy to transpose numbers, copy things incorrectly. So again, I think the smart version is helpful to try and minimize errors for employers. This 2016 updated form to the I-9 also had some other specific changes to Section 1 and Section 2, so let me go through those fairly quickly. Um, in Section 1, now we have a reference for other last name used in terms of the field. This was confusing because it used to say other names used, and so now by being more specific to let people know, they really want to know, did you have a different last name that helps to trigger something if we 
had an employee who's gotten married and may have a different maiden name than their current last name. Um, people used to assume that, well, I should put my nickname in here. This is not about nicknames at all. Um, again, just focused on the last name. Um, we also need to make sure that employers have to affirmatively answer whether or not they've had assistance in preparing section one to complete it, either by a preparer or a translator. Um, and, if, and if that's the case, then that individual who assisted with the completion of the Form I-9 needs to fill out their information as well. Third, with respect to foreign nationals, the foreign national only needs to supply one response from three possible options now. And that's providing an alien registration number, also known as an A number, an I-94 admission or departure number, or the number of their foreign passport. In Section 2, that's the employer section. We've also had several changes. Some of the highlights of those changes are the following. They've included a line to reference the employee's citizenship and immigration status at the beginning of Section 2. That was one of the items I just mentioned, so that when we carry over information from page 1, Section 1, for the, pertaining to the employee, we get the information correct on page 2. This can also serve as a good check and balance in case somebody answered incorrectly on page one. If it's carried over on page two and the items don't seem to match up, we may get a caution or a warning message. Also, there is now a dedicated box for comments and additional notes to be made by the employer representative. Why is this important? Well, for many of you charged with completing the I-9 forms in your organization, you know that there could be a number of times when we may get a receipt when we may have a delay in certain documents that we're writing in the, in the margins, um, either the receipt rule or whatever the case may be. Now, we don't have to search for a designated space on this form. They've actually provided us with some space to make any relevant notes that we need to. So a minor change here, but certainly a welcome one for employers um, so that we don't need to cram things in the margins anymore. So, when we had round two of changes to the Form I-9, that occurred in July of this year. Those were announced, and as I mentioned before, those took effect September 18th. So as of September 18th, we need to be using the current version of the Form I-9. And so what are our changes? Quite frankly, they're minor. Um, the bigger changes occurred in 2016, but the minor changes, um, some of them are simply to the instructions, and there's two of them. The first is that the name of the federal government office that addresses discrimination issues for I-9 purposes has been changed. It used to be the Office of Special Counsel for Immigration-Related Unfair Employment Practices. The name has simply been updated now to say Immigrant and Employee Rights Section. Again, may not make a difference to employers, but we do know that that's a change um, just so that you can be aware of the verbiage moving forward. The second change is, pertains to the instructions for completing Section 1. They used to say that Section 1 needed to be completed by the employee at the, by no later than the end of the first day of employment. The same rule applies. They've simply taken out reference to the end of employment. Same rule, again, the employee needs to complete Section 1 by the end of his or her first day of work. So don't be thrown off guard simply because they've removed, removed a few words. Okay, so we also have some minor changes to the list of acceptable documents. And those minor changes are as follows. We've got one new addition, and that's for Form FS-240, which is really a consulate report of a birth abroad. Um, this has been added as a new List C document. Uh, because we've made an addition to the list, you'll see that um, the list, the numbering of the documents acceptable in list C have now been renumbered. So everything shifts down, I think, a number from what it used to be. But this form, this consular report of a birth abroad, we can now accept this as an acceptable list C document. And all certifications for reports of birth issued by the Department of State, whether that's Form FS-545, Form DS-1350, or Form FS-240, they're now combined into one, this new one selection on the list of acceptable documents. 
So I think that pretty much addresses changes to the Form I-9. What I've done here for you is just attached, um, not sure that it may be as big as you'll need it to be, but this is what the new Form I-9 looks like. This is the form that you should be using moving forward. And if you'll note in the bottom left-hand corner on this form, it's got the version dated July 17th, 2017. I can't stress enough how important it is for employers, particularly manufacturing employers, where you don't always um, get the luxury of updating things constantly to make sure you're using this current form. Why? For the reasons that I've said before, you can get penalized in a monetary way for not using a current form. And human nature tells us that sometimes we don't always go back and update forms and we just end up photocopying the same new hire packets over and over again. Make sure this is a simple step that you can take to get yourself updated to check and confirm that you are in fact using the updated documents. The other piece to this, and you'll see there's page two, but significantly on page three, I have a number of clients that have laminated this page of the Form I-9, and this is what they put on the table when employees come in for orientation. I think that's a great idea, practically speaking. It lets employees know what they can and cannot give you for this I-9 verification process. What you have to do though, uh, and I know I probably sound like a broken record at this point, but we need to make sure that you're using the updated version. We don't wanna get caught where an employee says, I gave you a document, um, it was clearly on the new list, but you're using an old list and you never accepted my document. So if you frequently hand out the list of acceptable documents to employees and new hires, uh, please go ahead and make sure that you're actually using the most up-to-date form. We couldn't have an I-9 verification presentation or a discussion without just putting a couple key reminders in there. So let's take the opportunity to just go through some of the highlights here. First and foremost, time, timely completing the Form I-9. We've already talked and mentioned, first and foremost, that the employee has to complete Section 1 before the end of the day of his or her first day of employment with you. That's, that's the end parameter. We also know that the employer has to complete Section 2 within three business days after the first employee's day of work. So, for example, if an employee begins work for you on a Monday, their portion of Section 1 needs to be completed before end of day on Monday. The employer now has three more business days to complete Section 2. So that should be completed by no later than a Thursday. You can require, as an employer, to have employees complete their I-9 forms in advance of starting employment. That's never a problem. Um, in fact, we see that frequently. When you extend the offer, a lot of times people will put in the I-9 documentation. What you have to be careful of is that we do not want employers seeking information or trying to verify somebody's employment before the offer has been accepted. Because you need to make sure that you got offer and acceptance before you get this additional information on their work history, their birth certificate, because there's sensitive information there. Ethnicity, race, date of birth, and those are all things that quite frankly we do not want to have in our possession before we know that they've agreed to come on board. So again, for those that want to be ahead of the curve on some new hire documentation, perfectly acceptable, just make sure you're not extending that information and that request for information before the individual has actually accepted your offer. Okay, finally, for short-term employees, if the employee is expected to work for you or your manufacturing company for less than three days, we do not get the luxury of waiting three days to complete Section 2. So for somebody that's going to be with us less than three days, the entire verification process needs to be done on day one, no later than day one. Okay, some other timing issues that we have here. Um, as I mentioned before, we should be giving employees a copy of the last page of the I-9 form, which is that list of acceptable documents. 
the employee has the right to choose what documents to give to you. And I can't tell you how often I go in with employers or clients to do training or to look at audits. And we ask generally, what's your procedure? And sometimes the response that we get is, well, we just tell them what to give us. We've streamlined it. Employees don't understand this process. So we just say, for example, give me document X and document Y. We cannot do that. We should not be doing that. Why? Because what documentation the employee gives us is entirely up to them. The only guidance we should be providing them is that they can give us one list A document or in the alternative, a combination of one list B document and one list C document. Beyond that, we need to take a step back as employers and make sure that we are not somehow influencing or unduly influencing this verification process. We also need to make sure that we're actually checking these original documents that are being supplied to us. Not uncommon for manufacturing facilities um, to have multiple sites, multiple physical sites, plants, divisions, but maybe one centralized HR system where, let's just say hypothetically, um, headquarters is in Buffalo and we are, we've got plants all across New York State but I-9s are done in Buffalo. The concern is people are emailing or faxing documents saying, okay, Buffalo, we're sending it to you. We're sending you the photocopy. Go ahead and complete what you need to complete. That's not okay. We need to take the pause there because the person that completes step two on behalf of the company needs to actually physically touch those documents that have been supplied. Why? because they are in the best position to assess and analyze whether they think this is a truly legitimate document, whether it's on its face legitimate and reasonable. We can't do that and make that assessment with a fax copy, with an email copy. So make sure that the person that's completing section two for your organization is actually the person that reviewed the original documents. Um, frequently, we see companies have systems in place where one person will always be the one to sign off on section two when in fact they were not the individual to actually review these documents. If that's your organization, you would be well served to update your process and get in compliance with what you need to so that if you have an audit down the road, this is not an issue you'd be concerned about. Okay. So, accepting receipts. We need to make sure that in our process, so in terms of some other I-9 compliance issues, when we talk about documentation, we can talk about accepting receipts, as I mentioned, and there's three instances where we can accept receipts for I-9 purposes. The first is when an employee submits a receipt to us because they've either lost or have requested a replacement document. Um, not uncommon um, for documents to be lost, stolen, or in recent events, for example, if, if there was a natural disaster and documents were actually damaged, it's okay for us to accept a receipt that somebody has made a request for a replacement document. The second um, option is the receipt contains a form I-94 I or a temporary I-551 stamp and a photograph. This I-551 stamp can serve as a receipt for the actual form I-551, which is, in, in immigration speak, um, it's permanent residency. That's what the I-551 represents. The third is where we get a receipt uh, for a refugee admission stamp on the Form I-94. And in that case, the Form I-94 serves as the receipt either for employment authorization or for a social security card, um, which then the refugee has to follow up with you within 30 days to show you that actual document. So if, if you get something like that, you need to make sure that you then circle back with that employee in a timely fashion to actually review the actual card, whether that's an employment authorization card or the social security number. What is not acceptable when we're talking about these receipt rules is if you've got a new hire 
and the new hire as part of the initial I-9 verification presents you with a receipt notice to say, well, I submitted my application for work authorization, but it's still pending. In that case, if they're making an initial application for work authorization and this is the first time you are verifying them, that receipt is not acceptable. In all fairness, the receipt rules can be very confusing. If you have these issues, one tool that I think is helpful for employers um, that the Department of Labor has implemented is the updated version of the Employer I-9 Handbook. It's also referenced online as M-274, but there are certainly some helpful instructions there and some guidance for employers on how to address these, these technical rules um, when you get documents that you're not used to seeing as part of the I-9 verification process. Something else that we typically see is, is about copying documents in the I-9. There is no law that requires you to copy your documents unless you participate and you verify. Then you are obligated to, to copy whatever documents employees give you. But if you're not an E-Verify, the law does not say that you have to copy them. Many employers do because it's a good record of what we got and what we reviewed as part of this process. But if you choose to copy, you need to do so on a consistent, uh, unbiased basis. For example, we cannot say, well, we're gonna copy um, the documentation of those individuals who sound foreign. We can't do that because that leads us to discrimination issues. But if you are going to proceed with copying, please do so on an even, uniform, consistent basis and maintain those documents with your other I-9 records. Okay, re-verification. We never re-verify U.S. citizens. We never re-verify permanent residents. So doing so means it could land us um, in violation for document abuse. We're making people undergo this system more frequently than they need to. A note about changes to the Form I-9. Um, in addition to upgrading the actual forms that we've used, the government has updated the penalties. Um, it had been quite some time since the government um, took a look at and reviewed the monetary fines associated with I-9 violations. When they did so back in 2015 as part of the Bipartisan Budget Act, they realized, uh-oh, we're behind the curve and it doesn't account for some inflation which has taken place over the years. So what they said they did was adjusted the fines, and quite frankly, adjust they did. Uh, the adjustments were very significant. Just by way of example, penalties for paperwork violations increased by 96%. So these are not insignificant or insubstantial at all. These new penalties went into effect on August 1st of last year, 2016, and so they would apply to any violations occurring moving forward from that time. So what do we have in terms, what are some examples? Here are some examples. Penalties for knowingly hiring an individual who's not authorized to work in the United States. It used to be that the range was $375 to $3,200 for each offense. Now we are looking at penalties of $539 up to $4,300 per worker. Again, not insignificant. Second offenses. Those offenses increased as well. Now they range from 4313 to $10,781 for those repeat offenders for knowingly hiring individuals not authorized to work. And any subsequent offense, offenses for this same infraction have increased now to $6,469 up to $21,000 plus per worker. So uh, that's a significant jump. As I also noted, Record-keeping violations, um, technical violations have increased to now be in the range of $216 to $21.56 per record violation. When these all add up, it becomes quite significant for employers. Okay. Finally, in addition to the monetary penalties, the criminal penalties um, have also come into play here. Most recently, in fact, just last week, on September 28th, a suburban Philadelphia tree cutting company by the name of Esplenda 
tree expert company pled guilty to federal criminal charges of employing thousands of illegal workers throughout the country. This particular company had over 30,000 workers, but apparently a significant portion of that workforce was unauthorized. The problem in that case, this all stemmed from an audit from ICE, the enforcement arm of the Department of Homeland Security. They conducted an audit from 2010 to 2014 on this company, and they found that the top management of this tree company was willfully blind, their words, um, to, lower, to actions of lower level supervisors. The lower level supervisors were knowingly going back and hiring people that they knew were not authorized to work or bringing back people that had previously been fired because the company knew that they were not authorized to work. So the concern from the government perspective was that this is perpetuating fraudulent issues and practices in order to maximize productivity and profit. So several company managers also pled guilty to some of these criminal charges. Why are we talking about this? Why do we care? At the end of the day, it resulted in the largest I-9 penalty on record in the United States in the amount of $95 million. Now, $80 million was for the actual criminal offenses here, and the other $15 million were for all the civil penalties that the company went. So that's a quick history about the I-9 changes. Moving on, uh, we're just going to touch very, very briefly here on some common work pieces that we use and we see in the manufacturing center industry. Um, on this first slide, you'll see that we've got various immigration alphabet for work visas. This is really to highlight that there are a number of different ways that companies should think about if they need to bring in a foreign worker. Some of these will work for your organization, others may not, but here's what we typically refer to as the immigration alphabet. Most common visa that we see for manufacturers is the H-1 visa. And that applies to individuals who work in professional or specialty occupations, where they can come to the United States and work for any employer uh, with proper authorization for a total of up to six years in this H-1B category. In some cases, we can get beyond six years if we have done some work towards permanent residency or the green card process. Generally speaking, the H-1B requires a position that mandates specialized um, experience or uh, highly specialized knowledge. It typically requires somebody to have a bachelor's degree or higher in that field. And the individual also has to have the educational and experience requirements set by the company. The H-1B visa is a temporary visa, meaning that people have to have the intent to work for you temporarily with the intention of returning home once the visa, the visa is expired. However, H-1Bs are also dual intent which means that they can have the parallel track of also pursuing employment-based permanent residency without violating their H-1B status. The other key for employers and companies is if you're going to hire an H-1B worker, you have to pay them at or above the prevailing wage. That is a key, um, a key concept and a unique feature of the H-1B petition that some others do not have. Um, the problem with the H-1B is that demand is high, and yet availability is relatively limited. What do I mean by that? There is an H-1B cap, and each year, based on the federal government's fiscal year, they set aside 65,000 H-1B visas for bachelor's degrees, an additional 20,000 for individuals who have obtained a U.S. master's degree or higher. So roughly 85,000 H-1B visas. Years ago, it, the H-1B cap was never exhausted. More recently, I would say in the last four to five years, the H-1B cap has been exhausted within the first five days of the government making these numbers available. So as manufacturers, you may hear people scurrying about for an April 1 filing deadline. What does that mean? Well, employers file on April 1 each year because that's six months in advance of the government's fiscal year start date, which is October 1. So each year, companies file on April 1 for employment that will begin on October 1 of that year. What we tell clients is if you know you're going to have a need to hire an H-1B worker, do not wait until March 31st to make that decision. You want to be checking now. You want to be checking in January 
reaching out to your immigration attorney. Our clients typically call us in January and February and say, we have somebody, we wanna make sure we're in part of this H-1B cap cycle. Um, please prepare the petition so that we are set to go on April 1. We routinely do that for our clients. In fact, our clients are so used to this process now and planning ahead for their hiring needs. We have clients that have already reached out to us to work on their cases for 2018. So the moral of the story here is plan ahead. H-1B visas are just one type of work visa. We also have some other work visas, which we'll go through here very quickly. The B business visitor, not everybody that comes to us from other countries necessarily needs to be here for extended periods of time. You may have um, colleagues in other countries that simply need to come to the US for business meetings or to engage in contract negotiations or for a company seminar, what have you. If that's the case, then the B visitor visa may be entirely appropriate for you. We see this frequently in manufacturing um, facilities the B can be up to one year, but again, it's temporary. If the individual is coming here to work in the United States, the B visitor visa will not be the good visa because it does not enable the person to come to the U.S. to work. Simply to visit and engage in appropriate business activities, which are set forth on the slide. We also have a number of our manufacturing clients that like to employ students. Um, maybe students coming here to the United States to study in what we call F1 student status. Um, we see this a lot in manufacturing facilities where you may have co-ops or interns where the, the individual is still in school, but as part of, for example, their engineering degree, they need to gain some practical experience. If that's the case, you're either typically thinking about what's called CPT, curricular practical training, where it provides practical training comp components towards and consistent with the student's area of study. It takes place while the student is still in school and it requires an actual job offer from you along with some other supporting documentation. The other option that we frequently see for manufacturing companies is once the student has graduated. Once they've graduated, they themselves can apply for work authorization for one year for something called optional practical training. The good news with optional practical training, it does not require an employer to sponsor anybody. All you simply need to do during the I-9 verification process is ensure that they are authorized to work for you. But it gives you one year to try the candidate out um, and provide them work relevant to the degree that they just received from school. It's also ideal for many clients because it can bridge the gap if you're trying or planning on maybe seeking H-1B sponsorship for them this year of OPT employment can be helpful to bridge some timing issues for many clients. Finally, we've got the TN visa, and that's a temporary employment of individuals from Canada and Mexico. Um, the key piece here is that you can get it in durations of up to three years at a time. Um, extensions are permitted, so there is no numerical cap, if you will, that we have for H-1Bs, and there's no time limit on how long somebody can stay in TN status. Um, what the unique piece about the TN is, is that you have to be talking about a position that's on a scheduled list of occupation. And so it, it contemplates professionals in the fields of accounting, architecture, engineering, law, management consultants, and the like. So if you can fit your job onto the list and, and compare it and link it up to the list of occupations on the TN category, then you're gonna be in good shape. But again, this will not apply to everybody across the board. Finally, we've got L visas. Those are for intra-company transfers. Not uncommon in the manufacturing sector for there to be a parent or subsidiary company abroad, Canada, Germany, um, France, you name it, and a US entity. And sometimes companies want to make sure that they can transfer employees back and forth between the two. The L visa will allow you to do that. The L1A is for executives and managers, and the L1Bs are for individuals with specialized knowledge. Okay, so that talks about the visa. We think it's helpful to just highlight those so that clients have an understanding of what their options may be as you're considering potential candidates. But certainly, when we do our assessment and go through the immigration alphabet for a client, 
it's all very dependent on acts, the situation and the needs of the company and time. So just know that those are available for you. They may work, they may not. The last part of this presentation is designed to just address some of the immigration updates that we've seen from the Trump administration. Um, so let's begin with what I call travel ban, no travel ban. Um, it's been a roller coaster of a year since January on these travel issues. Um, we thought it relevant to mention here because many of our manufacturing clients have been impacted um, by this travel. Um, with some of their employees as to whether or not they can travel back home to visit family, whether they can travel abroad to other business ventures that the companies may have to do their work. And generally, um, HR, com HR departments have reached out because quite frankly, it's been chaos and it causes a lot of unease and unrest for clients. And one of the primary roles for HR professionals is to be the calming voice if you will, within the organization. So what do we have in terms of the travel? Well, in January, uh, January 27th to be exact, um, the federal administration issued Executive Order 13769. Uh, the title was Protecting the Nation from Foreign Terrorists and into the United States. Um, it's too bad they couldn't have picked something a little bit shorter to say, but we just refer to it as Executive Order 13769. It took effect immediately, no warning, no ramp up time. Um, and basically what it did was it suspended the entire US refugee program for 120 days and Syrian refugees indefinitely. It also suspended the entry of immigrants and foreign nationals from certain countries of concern. And so in this initial round, we had seven countries of concern and they're listed on the slide. So we've got Iran, Iraq, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, Syria, and Yemen. Um, People from those countries were not permitted to enter. There were significant legal challenges and what ensued in the coming days after January 27th was quite frankly, complete and utter chaos. I can tell you our phones uh, blew up from people calling, wanting not only clarification on what this meant, uh, but concern for what that meant moving forward for their employees. Litigation ensued and eventually, as we see here, uh, the implementation of this executive order was stopped by the court system. So the federal administration went back for round two, and in March, specifically March 6, 2017, we got a new executive order, which we call Executive Order 13780. It tried to correct some of the problems from the first time around, and it gave a lead time, if you will, of 10 days for implementation. So it would take effect March 16. In this, this time, it didn't include seven countries of concern, it included six. They removed Iraq from the list. Um, they also delineated that it would not apply to certain people who were already here in the US on a legitimate basis, that had proper visas, that were permanent residents, um, and the like. Um, it also removed the, the indefinite ban on Syrian refugees um, and included other measures designed to vet and protect and assess, quite frankly, um, who we are letting into this country. Travel ban number two was also stopped um, and halted by court litigation. So what we had, let's fast forward to June of this year, on June 26th, the U.S. Supreme Court actually permitted a portion of this travel ban to, be, to move forward. Um, specifically, they allowed the Trump administration to include foreign nationals from each of the six countries of concern to say that, you know, we cannot keep them outside of the United States. If they are from these countries of concern, it is still okay for them come, to come in as long as they have um, a bona fide relationship with somebody in the United States. Stated differently, if these people have no connection or no bona fide relationship with anybody in the United States, we can ban them. The ban was contemplated to begin June 29th and last for 90 days. So now we're, we're the latest and the greatest. And on Sunday, September 24th, um, not so long ago, President Trump issued what's called a presidential proclamation. So this time it's travel ban 3.0, but not done by executive order. The presidential proclamation uh, was entitled Presidential Proclamation in 
enhanced vetting capabilities and process for detecting attempted entry into the United States by terrorists or other public safety threats. Um, for a variety of reasons, I'm simply going to refer to it as the proclamation. Um, I'm beginning to think that people are getting paid by the word here when they create these titles. I don't know how much longer we could make it, but pretty lengthy title. Anyways, the proclamation basically served as a replacement to this second travel ban that came out in March. Now we find the proclamation pertaining to eight countries, not six. Five of those eight countries were previously on the list of designated countries of concern, and they remain there. They are Libya, Iran, Syria, Yemen, and Malia. But now we've also added three new ones, and those are Chad, Venezuela, and North Korea. Notably here, Iraq and the Sudan have been removed from the list, but the proclamation recommends additional scrutiny and vetting measures for individuals coming to the United States from these two countries. Significantly, unlike the prior travel bans where the restrictions were uniform across the board, the travel bans now in this proclamation vary by country. So in some cases, for example, North Korea, it says that they cannot enter at all, period. In other cases, Syria, for example, um, again, it's suspended for all non-immigrant and immigrant residents, but Somali citizens are simply subject to enhanced screening. So there is not an outright ban on them, but they will have to go under, undergo additional scrutiny and vetting measures. This presidential proclamation is scheduled to go into effect October 18th. So uh, we're less than two weeks away from yet another travel ban. So E-Verify, again, these are just some of the things that we've seen from the new administration on immigration issues that can impact your workers and some things that are in the rumor mill but will have an impact on you. One of those is E-Verify. For those of you not familiar with E-Verify, it's an internet-based system that employers can use to verify I-9 issues or I-9 data that you receive. And it compares the data that you input into the system with the Department of Homeland Security and Social Security Administration's records. It's a good second verification process that can serve as a check and balance for you. It's an additional verification step. It's not a replacement for any verification. E-Verify is not new to some employers. Federal contractors, for example, you've been using this for quite some time. We also have a number of states that have adopted laws requiring the use of E-Verify. But what's on the horizon? Where are we headed with this? Well, on the horizon for E-Verify, um, in our 2018 budget, President Trump proposed $15 million, $15 million enhancements to the Department of Homeland Security's budget in order to begin implementation of a mandatory E-Verify system. So many of our clients have resisted um, opting into E-Verify under the guise of, I will do it when it's mandated. The Trump administration would like to mandate E-Verify. Uh, rest easy, the Trump administration alone cannot mandate it without an act of Congress. So Congress will ultimately decide, but we know that this administration is pushing for mandatory E-Verify across the board, which again, could very well impact manufacturers because it's one step. But we're not there yet, so stay tuned. We know from immigration purposes that certain visas have also been in the crosshairs of the Trump administration. One of those being the H-1B. You recall a few minutes ago, I gave a very, very brief overview of the H-1B visa. And if you've read the articles or seen the news in the last several months, you know that this administration has been attacking the H-1B visa program with an executive order and with language um, in the mantra of buy American, hire American. What they want to do is crack down on the fraudulent use and abuse, quite frankly, of the H-1B program. So they have directed several federal agencies, Department of Labor, Justice, Homeland Security, and Department of State to suggest reforms to the H-1B program. The goal is ultimately to make sure that they can focus on bringing high-skilled workers to the United States on H-1B visas rather than lower-skilled workers. Higher-skilled workers obviously are going to mean higher wages that employers need to pay 
They've also looked at and taken steps to implement higher filing fees to maybe discourage some employers from using H-1B visas. What I can also tell you from the practical perspective is that we have seen a significant increase as immigration practitioners in uh, pushback from the Immigration Service Department um, with challenges to H-1B petitions in this H-1B cycle. So in the past couple months, um, you can see them. It used to be if you had a, a, an H-1B case, absent some major omission, it would likely get approved. Now we're seeing more often than not, the presumption is not necessarily its approval, but they are asking for further information to ensure that it truly is a specialty occupation, that it meets the requirements of the H-1B requirements and regulations. So we're seeing a lot of pushback there, which again is just an additional signal for us that this particular work visa is coming under fire. Another work visa possibly coming under fire, but we don't want to alarm anybody just yet, may be the TN visa. A lot of our manufacturers, particularly those in New York State, rely on the TN visa um, to have cross-border transportation or a cross-border exchange with Canadian and Mexican workers. And earlier in May this year, the Trump administration noted and announced an intent to renegotiate NAFTA. TN visas are possible through NAFTA. So this raised some issues and some concern with clients who rely on TN workers to come into the United States. Um, we don't know at this point in time if a renegotiation to NAFTA will Im impact or touch these TN visas, but the possibility is there. So we just want to make sure that people are aware that this there is no definite um, decision on this either way, but this visa could be in jeopardy down the road. Finally, we're taking a look at the end of DACA, uh, which is Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. Um, this was announced on September 5th, that there was a formal plan to end this program. And, and why is this concerning for some employers? Well, first of all, DACA allows illegal immigrants who entered into the U.S. as children um, to receive a renewable two-year deferred action. One of the other benefits to the DACA program is that it allows these individuals to apply for work authorization. So even though they may not be here legally, there, there is a mechanism right now for them to get legal work authorization, which allows employers, manufacturers included, to employ these individuals. The concern is that DACA is scheduled now to end on March 5th, 2018, and as of September 5th, no new applications were being accepted. And as of yesterday, October 5th, you had to get your renewal in um, by that date. Otherwise, it wouldn't be considered. The concern here is some of you may be saying, well, how do I know if I've got somebody employed by DACA? So what we, was, what we are suggesting to our clients is that you identify those individuals who are employed under this DACA rubric, this umbrella, by looking at your Form I-9s, copying your I-9 documents, taking a look, and you can tell because those work authorization documents will have a category code on there of C-33. That's a signal that somebody received employment verification under this DACA program. You're gonna to wanna to identify the end date for those individuals um, so that you can be aware. Chances are when you go back to re-verify them, when that end date is about to expire, they may not be able to get new work authorization. But keep that in mind, a good place to start for now is to just identify, do you have any of these workers in your workforce? Second, but not to be forgotten before we conclude here, is that the government recently announced what we call extreme vetting interviews for employment-based green cards. So under our process, um, employers can petition for employees for a permanent residency employment-based green card. Those employees were never subject to in-person interviews until now. So beginning in October, um, just last week, or maybe this week because it's the first full week, employees that you have sponsored for permanent residency through your organizations will now have to be scheduled to go in person to see an immigration officer to be interviewed as part of this green card process. It's important to know because it's an additional expense and it's an additional 
step, which will lengthen the overall time that it takes individuals to get the green card. And finally, there's not much to say about this at the moment, but we know that there has been talk and discussion about building the wall. And the question about how that will impact manufacturers and workers that you employ remains to be seen, but, but certainly uh, we all continue to monitor that as we move forward. This concludes the end of our presentation. Um, and I've gotten one or two questions, so we'll, we'll take a couple of those questions um, as we've got here. So one question that's come in is about I-9s. Uh, and the question is, during the orientation process, employees frequently ask me what documents to produce for the I-9 verification process. I normally tell them to bring in a copy of the driver's license and social security card. Is this okay? The answer is no. Um, we as employers should not be instructing or otherwise directing employees as to the type of information to give us. In, as part of the I-9 process. Again, the best approach here is to give them the list of acceptable documents and let the employees select what they want to give to you. Okay. Um, we, we've got another question on the phone that if an employer notices during an I-9 audit that the forms were not completed accurately, would the employer use the most current form of the I-9 and request new documents if they've expired since their date of hire? The answer to that is, is yes, um, if we're talking about expired documents, because you need to go back and make sure that you got the proper re-verification. If you are doing re-verification, you should always be using the current form. But in the event of an internal audit, I always like to put an explanatory memo with it, maybe just a separate sentence or two on a piece of paper that you paper clip to the Form I-9 now your two form I-9s, because we don't want to get rid of the initial form that basically says that errors were discovered during a voluntary self-audit and it was corrected on such and such a date. So make sure that you're not backdating anything, but it's entirely appropriate for you to go ahead and, uh, and proceed as you've suggested here. Okay, lots of I-9 questions. Uh, one more I-9 question here. Uh, during the I-9 process, I make photocopies of the employee's documents and staple them to the Form I-9. Uh, can you please confirm that by following this method, I do not need to complete Section 2 since I've actually attached the documents to the form itself? No. Again, this process is not correct. Nothing I would recommend you to do. So even if you make photocopies, Section 2 has to be properly and fully completed by the employer representative and then that employer representative has to sign um, section two. Do not cut corners, I don't recommend it. Don't use abbreviations or skip filling things out simply because it may be easier for you. Cutting corners in the beginning is going to lead pro to problems down the road. Um, the other point that I would also just mention here from what we've observed in the past, like I said, a short form, but many people don't give it the weight and significance that they should. Think about the penalties that we just talked about earlier in this presentation. A company was just fined $95 million because they didn't do this process correctly, and in fact, they completely ignored it. Uh, we sometimes see that the I-9 responsibility, if you will, is often given to the person lowest in the totem pole or in the department, or even an intern in some cases. I can't tell you how important it is to take this process seriously because just look at the fines alone. And, and we want to take this very seriously because if you have the wrong person completing this step for the organization, uh, the monetary fines, the civil penalties, and the potential criminal charges could be catastrophic for an organization. Um, so you need to make sure that whoever is tagged with this responsibility not only understands what they're doing, uh, but has been properly trained to do it. This is not an area where we want to experiment um, just because it's not a task we like doing. Okay, and with that, I think we're set to go. We want to thank everybody for joining us today and for joining us this whole week for our manufacturing series. Thank you and uh, take care.